So I am following the lead of a Hungarian psychiatrist, Stefan Sara, if you know his name. So he was the first who used the DMT in a research setting. So Rick Strassman just followed him and uh, uh, gives homage to St Stefan Sara. He's still alive, about 88 years old. So he used, but he used IM. And you know, Rick Strassman used IV. And uh, 30 years later, with a much better research technique. So I am a DMT researcher, IOSCO researcher. So, and do you know why I became about 15 years ago a DMT hallucinogen researcher? At that time, I was in the United States. And as I saw that my big shots colleagues, researchers, they didn't want to discuss about hallucinogen psychedelics, you know, that was totally taboo topic. So I am the little Hungarian scavenger, you know, who takes up what the big carnivores they leave behind themselves. I said, great, for you it is a dirty issue, then I see no, comp uh, no uh, rivalry, you know, no competition. And basically I was right. For the beginning there was no competition. When I started to make publications about ayahuasca, after free publication I gave 10% of the ayahuasca papers because there was, at that time was only 30 ayahuasca papers. But you know since uh, for the last 10 years there is a psychedelic renaissance. So suddenly psychedelics became again a hot issue in psychiatry and in research. They were in the 50s. To students we never dare to say that the so-called biological psychiatry that did not start with antidepressant and antipsychotic medication that started with LSD. In the 50s the whole psychiatry psychology was teared up. Such a tiny amount of chemical can profoundly change human consciousness. So so the 50s, you know, it was over. During the 60s, uh, it was much more about other use than research. And there was a moratorium since the 70s. There was no real study on hallucinogens and psychedelics. So for the last 10 years, it's coming up. There are some countries like Switzerland, Spain, or the Riba in Spain. We can study ayahuasca with healthy volunteers. In the U.S. they can uh, study psychedelic uh, and ecstasy with patients. You know, it's more serious. Healthy volunteers, you can get permission much easier than for patients. How are you here in Estonia? Any hallucinogen researcher here? Even I am the Hungarian hallucinogen researcher. I do my studies in South America. Just uh, during the last year, then I started to do some cell tissue studies. I will show you what uh, we have got thus far, what is our idea about it. So today, I brought you a little culture, mysticism, uh, psychedelic effects, uh, and we can discuss as you wish. So what I am, I can discuss about shamanism, Shama, the basics of shamanic medicine and uh, as, a, I'm, as a psychopharmacologist so yeah that's my first profession of that psychiatry during the first couple of slides I would like to uh, pay honor to the South American civilization what I revere so much and I would like to show these pictures uh, because I wish you to understand why I admire so much that civilization. But somehow I find in Europe we still underrate after 500 years of discovery. I think we don't know what kind of great civilization it was. For example, do you know what was the largest city in Europe? Oh, no, no, not Europe. All over the world. In the end of 15th 50th century, Perry, you know, one of the biggest, 200,000 population, Naples, 
that was the golden era of Naples, you know, that was the second biggest European city, but still they were not the biggest on earth. Tenochtitlan, the Aztec city, was the largest city at that time. But can you name me one large South American thinker? Do you know any name? Just imagine, when cultures met, for example, we had the Crusades and we met with the Islam, you know, there was an ideological exchange, dispute between those two cultures, besides, you know, the warfare. We got ideas to and fro, especially from that time we got many from Islam, you know, we got the uh, Greek Roman tradition from them. We, in Europe, we forgot that. And of course we know big names, you know, Muslim names. But after this contact, what started 1492, no one of you can remember one name. Do you know why? Basically it's not your fault. Basically, no one left alive. Because after 1492, the largest genocide in history happened. Uh, I was surprised when Louis Luna, you know his name, many of them I suppose, so basically I got these slides from him and I, you know, following his idea on this. At that time, one third of, at least one third of the world population lived in the Americas. So, Americas was not an empty continent, what later Europeans supposed, you know, a pristine, <coughs> empty land. It, first of all, it was not pristine. There was agriculture there, but do you know why we did not notice that they had agriculture? Because it was so advanced. The European agriculture, just monoculture, you know? 100 hectares only, you know, wheat or barley. The American type of agriculture was using ecosystems, mixing different plants. So, one third of the population lived there and 90, up to 95 percent uh, died within 100 years. So, of course, so no one can remember, you know, who were the thinkers of that previous great civilization. Absolutely died out. This was the uh, largest genocide in history. Of course, most of the reason was illnesses, not only one. Uh, European illnesses came in wave, waves. S Central Mexico, the population was 25, so you can extrapolate, you know, that death rate to the 100 million, what we suppose nowadays they lived in the Americas. So look at that. After about 100 years, from 25 million, population went down to 700,000. It's more even than 95% uh, decline. And mostly illnesses, smallpox, uh, plague, this is a hantavirus infection, this coccolizzi, and the measles and all. And next to illness, it was us, Europeans. Columbus had some dilemma about how to handle the inhabitants of America. So he had some moral di dilemma. He find them so innocent but at the same time, he supposed they are good for slavery. The followers of Columbus, they had no scruples, you know, basically the conquistadores, they did not uh, consider them as equal humans. Oh, this is even, you know, 100 years later, the contact, this is the typical Victorian view on South America. Atuhalpa, a weak, effeminate native leader, uh, the natives, they are frightened, superstitious, and the conquistadors, you know, the heroic ones, and, and here's the advancer of uh, Christianity. And do you know what? Uh, this has not changed. Maybe the labels, you can change a little bit. So, right now the native is the heroic, and the now conquistadors, they are frightened. This was about the Belo Monte Dam, you know, they wanted to remove the Indians from that area, so... But of course they are frightened because uh, of the media, you know, so not from the Indians. Uh, so basically standard, 
he wrote a book about this genocide, what happened within 100 years after the contact, you know, 1492. And what he says that this kind of genocide is not over yet, it is still ongoing. In Guatemala, during the last 20 years, 80,000 Maya Indians were killed because of the land. So basically, you know, it's, it's still not over yet. And this is a typical view what Europeans hold on Aztecs and Mayas, you know, somewhat barbarian, you know, this human sacrifice. But look at these guys. I don't see too much difference. You see? This is the Spanish Inquisition. This is also the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, once uh, for the ascent of Jesus into heaven, they, bur they hanged 13 Indians after Jesus and the 12 apostles. And the way they hanged them, basically this uh, uh, figure is not right because their hand could reach the ground, tiptoed, you know, the rope on their necks, and they put fire under their uh, feet so they had the choice to suffocate or suffer or burn. So, basically, my point here, and I will show you that two civilizations clashed after 1492, and we know what was the fate of one, and the fate of that one, you know, which died out, it was because that civilization knew better how to feed people, or civilization knew better how to kill them. Why they knew how to feed people? Just look at this. Nowadays, one uh, three, three fifths of the total food crops of the world originates from the New World, from Americas. So you know this well. You know about corn, pumpkin, tomato, uh, potato, but uh, maybe it's not everyone knows sunflower, bean. They also came from the Americas, and manioc. Africa, you know, it's an important food source, manioc in Africa. They got it from the tropical Americas. So my point is here that that was a civilization which knew plants much better than we knew. So basically, this is one reason why I admire them <coughs> so much. The reason they know plants much better one main reason that the plant species density per square mile is 10 times higher than in tropical Africa. So in the Amazon basin, the number of species of plants within each square mile 10 times higher than in tropical Africa. Even the Indonesian rainforest cannot catch up to that kind of uh, species density and diversity, diversity. Interestingly, anyone who is interested in ecosystem, do you know why the Amazonas basin is so rich in plants? The climate is the same like in Africa. Do you know why? Because it's flat, absolutely flat. Thousand miles and just 100 meter drop in the ground level. So basically the rivers, they change course every year. So they never flow in the same path. And because there is always a new path of the river, there every year a new ecosystem comes up. And that's an enormous uh, species pump. So that's one reason that the plant population, uh, species number is so high. Okay, that was just a historical introduction, you know, why to respect so much these people whom we know so little, not even their names. And I told you about Stephen Sara. Oh, this is uh, Alex Gray's excellent painting, you know, the DMT, the spirit molecule. <laughs> what you should know about DMT, dimethyltryptamine, which is the, one of the active ingredients of ayahuasca, that this is an endohallucinogen. You probably heard it, that we have it in the body. But do you know what? What you read thus far on the internet, that DMT is in the pineal gland, until the last year it was just an assumption. The first time that DMT was really 
scientifically detected in the human body, it was last year. Steve Barker, his assay technique was sensitive enough. Thus far, we just speculated that because there is an enzyme which synthesizes DMT in our body, in our brain, and that enzyme can only synthesize DMT, nothing else. So most of the speculation was that because this enzyme is there, that DMT must be an endohallucinogen and present in our body. Sometimes this kind of amines we call trace amine. Normally you don't find them, cannot detect them. But under, circum under certain circumstances, this trace amine can be released in a huge amount. And that was another topic later. What are those certain circumstances when DMT is released in your body? Anyone who is interested in pharmacology, they suppose that DMT is acting on the serotonin receptors. This is still accepted, widely accepted. I see problems with it. We know serotonin agonist chemicals which are not psychedelic, not hallucinogens. So it's very, very complex. And lately, three years ago, they discovered that DMT acts on sigma-1 receptors. Sigma-1 receptors, uh, for the last five, ten years, they were not clear what they can do. And still you can find papers what suppose, ah, sigma-1 receptor is responsible for the DMT's hallucinogenic effect. And I will show you that it is not the case. Sigma-1 receptor does something even more interesting. Oh, what is psychedelic? Just, you know, how to call these chemicals like DMT? It's very confusing. Uh, one word is psychedelic, and just for remind, as a reminder, what Tim Leary said, you know, psychedelic is a drug which can cause psychotic, so crazy behavior in someone who ne never took it. And this is my definition, that psychedelics or hallucinogens, they are drugs when everyone has a strong opinion about it with very weak uh, resources. As, this is especially for my colleagues, you know, doctors, psychologists in my profession, all of them have some strong opinion about this, and I don't know where did they get it from. Not from personal experience, uh, not from scientific lectures. In Hungary, there was only two symposia, scientific meeting on hallucinogens. I organized those two. And uh, the media, you can forget it. You know well, media is uh, over exaggerating issues, uh, scandalizing, so it's not a real resource. How to call these kind of chemicals? I used here psychedelic because psychedelic is still the best term. Because hallucinogen, really not. So professional literature likes better hallucinogen term than psychedelic. Psychedelic is, you know, the internet literature. Or, but uh, even Strass, Rick Strassman in the book we wrote together, he, he rather picked the psychedelic term, regardless that it has a connotation from the 60s, you know, about the hippie culture. We don't care, you know. Basically, my manifesting that expresses the best way. Hallucinogens, many, many people they don't even have visions on DMT or under mushrooms. They have insights, you know, some messages, some meaningful messages. But, uh, and I have seen hallucina hallucinating schizophrenics for the last 25 years every day. I listen to ayahuasca sharings, you know, in Brazil, in with Luis Luna's help, you know, after ayahuasca ceremonies, we used to share those experiences. So I am listening to what people say. I see no resemblance uh, between schizophrenic hallucinations and uh, ayahuasca usually visions. I cannot say hallucinogen. Hallucino hallucinogens, you know, when you can see it with open eyes. Many, many instances, you have to close your eyes and then you will see things. If you open it, they disappear. So rarely happens that the snake queen doesn't want to climb off the mirror. You know, that rarely happens. But most of the time, you have the visions if you close your eyes. And these are the worst 
terms which uh, uh, consider that uh, psychedelics can cause mental illness, psychosis. No, uh, psychedelics they will not cause mental illness, but they can trigger if someone is already schizophrenic, even if the person doesn't know about it. So that's true if someone has schizophrenia or bipolar disorder and the person is in the premorbid condition, so doesn't have the first episode yet, psychedelics, they can, you know, trigger one. But no one will be schizophrenic just because, you know, using uh, DMT uh, mushroom or whatever. So definitely if the question is under what condition ayahuasca DMT psychedelics are contraindicated, I have to tell you this kind of big mental illnesses like schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, yes, it is in agreement with Rick Strassman that uh, these kind of conditions really they don't respond well under this effect. So that's the only relationship between psychedelics and psychosis. This was one name in the 1920s, Fantastica, or you know, sometimes they called entheogens, you know, because of the spiritual experience, this kind of uh, chemical compounds can elicit. This is Kwanak Parker, the co-founder of the Native American Church. So he said, the white man goes into his church and talks about Jesus. The Indian goes into his tipi and talks to Jesus. Or Jesus talks to him. So This is just for those who are close to my profession. You know, when I compare what's the difference between psychosis and psychedelic effect. First of all, psychedelic effect is voluntary, psychosis is not, and an experienced psychedelic user will not mix up his or her experiences with this reality. Maybe the person says that's another reality, but usually they do not mix it up, like schi schizophrenic psychotic patients. They suppose that the visions, hallucinations are originating from this reality. And the very important, that psychosis comes with defragmentation. Those poor people, they are falling apart. But if the set and setting right, psychedelic can be creative. You know, be on the contrary, they are not defragmenting. Perhaps people can get defragmented, you know, ego dissolution feelings, experiences can happen during the experience. But after a reintegration phase comes, and people can do something creative. I also had a paper that ayahuasca increases creativity, not during the experience, days after. Days after. This is a published paper. And uh, Benny Shannon said that an experienced user is a co-dancer with the drug. No one leads the other. They are together, like in a good uh, South American tango. I follow Dennis McKenna's classification. So, for example, Dennis McKenna, he does not consider cannabis as a real psychedelic, neither ecstasy. So, first of all, the classical psychedelics are the serotonin type, those which are very close to the serotonin uh, neurotransmitter, uh, such as dimethyltryptamine, psilocin or psilocybin, mescaline, but it also has, besides serotonin effect, a dopaminergic effect. And LSD, that's purely serotoninergic. Ibogain and salvinorin, perhaps. Salvinorin, you should know that it is not on serotonin receptor acting, it's on kappa, opiate receptor acting drug. You should know that the psychedelic effect has two phase. And the reason that the Western authorities, they are so afraid of it because they only know about this, disintegration. Yes, they can cause disintegration. Basically what they do, they can change ingrained behavioral patterns. Do you know how I figured it out? Uh, ten years ago I worked 
in Gainesville, North Florida. There was a huge hospital there. And Gainesville in the 1970s was the capital, the psychedelic capital of the US. So in the 60s, San Francisco in the 70s, Gainesville was the psychedelic capital. So there were still people, you know, around there who were working underground in the shade. For example, this kind of guy, perhaps you still can find his name even after 10 years on the internet, Eric Taub, of course it's an alias, not the real name. Uh, his webpage, I Begin Again, I Begin Again, it's alliterating Ibogain. He used to give Ibogain to heroin users. Because Ibogain, this is an uh, African uh, hallucinogen from Gabon, from the Dwiti, Dwiti t uh, tribe, and it's a very, very long acting, two days very very overwhelming very very overwhelming and very very scary uh, psychedelic experience but somehow they noticed that if a heroin or opiate addict goes into two days of ibogaine treatment the two days is enough to get the patient patient the person over the withdrawal reactions you know it can be very painful, the withdrawal reaction of the opiates, especially heroin. But no withdrawal reaction and no craving. So because, you know, drug treatment, two important issues. Uh, many, many drugs, the withdrawal reaction, the somatic dependence you have to help with. Then what you are left with is the is psychological dependence, which is usually craving for the drug. Somehow Ibogaine handled both. Of course, not 100%. If people want to use drug, they will use drug, you know? <laughs> <laughs> the point is that ibogaine was about the same like a three months long rehabilitation treatment, you know? <laughs> Just listen to this. <laughs> if you want to hear some other chit chat about this, uh, it was in a huge uh, psychopharmacological, meet, psychopharmacological meeting a couple of years ago. Amsterdam, uh, when the first time I heard that ibogaine treatment was in the mainstream. So a very big mainstream psychopharmacological conference. Hello, Deborah Nash from Miami to discuss her ib ibogaine treatment of opiate dependence. Just let me show you, but I'm sure you are not shocked, not surprised by this, that before Deborah Nash presentation, there were two British colleagues of us who gave intrafemoral into the thigh artery or uh, no vein, intrafemoral heroin because uh, they could not handle those heroin users other way, you know, harm reduction. Some of them, so but the point is they had no veins on their arms, intrafemoral heroin every day taxpayers money so for me it's not, not the taxpayer part but this intrafemoral part every day it's phew, pretty desperate the chairman of that meeting you can figure it out which presentation he announced as controversial for the chairman these two presentations were not controversial intra intrafemoral heroin every day just Deborah Nash because she gave by mouse, by mouse, once, <laughs> ibogaine, that was controversial, so uh, I hope it was not, uh, there were other same people in the room, not only me, <laughs> who said something is off here. So that, that's the ibogaine, and I had a patient who came to me from this Eric Tau, whatever his real name, and he said, Doc, it's not only heroin I stopped using, I stopped smoking, and I stopped jogging. <laughs> Oops! <laughs> that, that, that gave me a whole part. So there is the habits, you know, the ingrained everyday habits, they are kicked out, you know, disintegration. Deborah Nash, I just heard, it's a gossip, that she had some high-class, affluent uh, clientele, you know, musicians, uh, uh, violin players, 
who went through the ibogaine treatment, of course, uh, Deborah Nash could not do it in the U.S. They left, you know, uh, the, the country to the Caribbean islands. Uh, I was thinking if there are casino boats on international waters, perhaps there are psychedelic boats, you know, <laughs> under international waters. So, and those musicians, they forget their play. They have to relearn it. So, so much about disintegration. But there is another part, the reintegration. This is what the West does not know as much. Not only our authorities, but even us guys, we users, sometimes they, we do not get here. Because we don't have the right setting for this, the right ritual. So it depends big time on the right ritual. Disintegration it also depends very much on the right set and setting and ritual because it can go awry. You know, it can go off. I, I heard that someone after ayahuasca got a depersonalization lasting weeks. Even after the same happened, uh, I heard about a case after ecstasy. So the chemical was out of the bloodstream and the person could not see her face in the mirror. And she felt that she is not the same like she was. So yeah, it can happen. So this is disintegration. So both needs the right set and setting. That's, that's important to know. But especially the reintegration. What I have heard that, as you heard, this ibogaine treatment was possibly mostly about disintegration. But in Amsterdam they also do some ibogaine, but they put some emphasis on the reintegration. So after the ibogaine is over, the person still goes through rituals after a couple of days, which are facilitating the reintegration. So this, this is what native people knew well. So the real psychedelic shamanic ceremonies, they usually paid equal attention to both sides. I notice the parallel between initiation and the psychedelic effect. I called it proper if it is done in a proper set and setting. Anyone who knew about initiation, uh, usually they separate a symbolic death phase and they speak about a symbolic rebirth. So for me it echoes, you know, this disintegration and reintegration, what hallucinogens, psychedelics can elicit, and, and we know that psychedelics they can be used for initiation. And uh, but not necessarily, the CU Sundance doesn't use hallucinogens, they use extreme physical stressing, you know, for this disintegration. And uh, so, just think about it. What is the social role? What is the use of initiation in these Aboriginal cultures? By the way, I think we miss this very much in our culture. We don't have initiations. Come on, blanketing in the college, that's nothing to do with real initiation, you know? By the way, blanketing was part of the CU Sundance, you know, the preparation. Sometimes they covered with a blanket, the initiate, and, you know, that was part of the physical stress they put him under. But if you think about it, what happened most of the tribes who had initiation, the little boy or little girl, they do initiations for girl as well, but let's say little the little girl went into the initiation and after a couple of days, or sometimes one week, an almost adult came out of, it, out of it. The boy left the mother's home and went into the long house of the man. So he was considered as a man. Of course he was not a full matured man, but probably something very significant happened during this couple of days. What I interpret that the behavioral pattern has changed. During initiation, the childish behavioral pattern yeah. were, you know, wiped away. And in the reintegration phase, just anyone who knows the seal dance, how does it happen? The preparation, which lasts for days, any kind of physical stress you can imagine, they undergo. You know, they are chased in thorny bushes, they throw them in icy waters, they put them in the sweat lodge, they leave them in darkness, isolation for 24 hours, many, many, many stresses. For me, interestingly, 
one stress was not part of the initiation those what I studied I haven't seen it yet that kind of stress what we humans social animals the most sensitive are to do you think what kind of stress what we human animals they are more sensitive to and they can be devastating for us rejection not isolation no you can be isolated but you can still feel that your peers are with you your mates are thinking about you because this is in the seal Sundance they were isolated but they knew that the elderly they paid their respect you know so basically no rejection so what is interesting in initiation, especially this warrior type initiation, this CU Apache, very tough initiation, that the young guy who will be a warrior gets every kind of stress, what you can imagine, but in a supportive social atmosphere. You know that saying, which does not kill you, will make you stronger? It's only true if it is happening within a supportive social environment if it is happening you know in a rejective you know humiliating social environment no the stress will make you weaker the boot camps what we had i was you know i had my military training in the warsaw pact army anyone <laughs> that was not about respect you know guys <laughs> that was about humiliation <laughs> basically special forces they already learned from prairie Indians they do not humiliate their people you know they put them into extreme stress but no humiliation so that's a crazy idea what Western European uh, military training suppose we have to humiliate the guys crush their egos that's why we have so high PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder you know after each combat or war can you imagine you know after these wars we had during the last 40 years the post-traumatic post stress rate, you know, the British American troop in Afghanistan, Iraq, Americans in Vietnam, they have 25-30% rate post-traumatic stress disorder, war neurosis in those soldiers who return. Can you imagine a prairie, uh, great American Great Plains warrior Indian tribe who will have 30% of PTSD after each year's war? Every year they had a war, you know? with the Cherokee, with the Blackfoot, you know, they were very warm. No, they knew how to handle it. And one way to handle it, I think, right initiation. So the point is here, the behavioral pattern is changed. What is the reintegration part in initiation? You know, in this CU Sundance I mentioned. So I told you the introductory part, days, you know, of physical stress, then the real ceremony starts that the guy gets the hook, you know, under the chest. You know some Sundance when they are pulled up and they are hanging this way. There are other ways, sounds horrible, but guys, guys, uh, let me explain you what is the difference between this and us. And the other, what I studied more deeply, when the the ropes, they are tied to a pole, and the initiate has to dance, pull it, and eventually tear it out. You can imagine it can happen when the guy is totally in trance, totally out to lunch. <laughs> My explanation that he's endogenous opiates, you know, you heard me, there are endogenous hallucinogens, there are endogenous opiates, we know it for 40 years, probably it's totally up, and the guy lays down in trance, and not only one, there are usually many other initiates. And for hours and hours, the elderly, you know, those who are already initiated, they are reciting, chanting the deeds of their ancestors. The whole uh, mythology of the tribe, you know, is basically hammered into the initiate who is lying there in trance and who had ayahuasca or other kind of experience you know it's very suggestible you know our senses are very sharp so we are very suggestible Bruno Bettelheim a psychoanalyst he said if a European child listens to the same same grim 
fairy tale, the grim tales, you know, 50 times a year, the whole value system of that fairy tale will sink into him. Here, you see, it happens within hours. They sink 50 times, you know, the deeds what the ancient did, and basically they can accomplish within hours what we in Western education we cannot do within 12 years and Western psychotherapy doesn't want to deal with it. Western psychotherapy doesn't want to transfer values. You know, that's anyone who is familiar with psychotherapy, values, no, no, you know. We are not supposed to hammer all values into the patient. Oh, just a little bit. Uh, this kind of psychedelics, what I named for you, the psychedelic proper, you know, DMT, psilocybin, uh, mescaline, peyote, and so on, they are somewhat different like other recreational drugs, the uppers and the downers. Because downers and uppers, most of the time people use what I call for escapism, to escape from reality. Either because, oh, guys, I have hundreds of patients, you know, who don't want to deal with the hassles of everyday life. And do you know what? Yeah, we also live in East Europe. They have every reason, you know, not to deal with the everyday hustles of life. <laughs> I don't know how was it with you. For us Hungarians, this regime change did not brought, you know, the canon and so on. Many, many people impoverished, especially in psychiatry. I see those most of the time who are impoverished, no electricity there. It turned off. And so, of course, you know, they use any kind of donors to forget it. And we know the youngsters, they use the uppers, you know, to get some high and heavy, of course. Many of us, they still use it. It's all right just if it, is, it becomes a habit, you know, big time, because it turns away from life. And this way, it is the opposite. What is therapy about? Therapy, you know, is about facing life changes. So if I treat someone, that person will be able to get back to life and face, face the challenges or my depressed patients can go back to life and enjoy it. So basically, this tool of escapism, they elicit something totally opposite what therapy does. And interestingly, if you watch what, for example, ayahuasca can do, ayahuasca on this side. Guys, ayahuasca shows into your face if you don't want to face some issues in your life. If you have a difficult relationship with your son or with your father, you cannot keep it under the rug. I ask him, you know? Here, here you are. And basically, I ask him, does it, I won't say gently, no, something <laughs> hammering into you, but you will, most of the time people are not crushed, you know, just coming out with a smile on their face. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I deserve that, I deserve that. So, as you see, it, it is not about denial. And as far as recreation, come on, <laughs> you know, throwing up and puking and <laughs> shitting around. <laughs> Someone said, oh, if this was a recreational drug, you know, my, my appendectomy surgery was a recreational activity. So definitely, yes, sometimes Ayasko can give you, you know, a very recreational thing, entering the tryptamine palace. You know, it can be very recreational, but who knows in advance? You never know in advance what will you get. Unpredictable, unpredictable. Uh, by, by the way, <laughs> on the Royasco, entering the tryptamine palace, you have to earn it. At least you have to keep a good diet, you know, so you have to follow the rituals, what they recommend. And yes, uh, uh, this kind of uh, agents can cleanse the doors of perception, what Aldous Huxley said, uh, following William Blake and I don't want it is too 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 deep you know it deserves a whole new presentation but you should understand that I give some some uh, reality some of these experiences people have especially you know the experienced shamanic uh, healer uh, sometimes they really get some information but who knows where it has come from. So basically, uh, 
uh, if you know my book, what we had together with Louis Luna Rick Strassman, Inner Path to Outer Space, my f chapters were motivated first of all because I was interviewed what's happening during the shamanic journey. Where the hell the shaman is traveling to? You should know that uh, I promise you to discuss a little bit the basics of shamanic medicine. So who is the shaman? Those who are familiar with Mircea Eliade, you know, he said that the technician of ecstasy. There is a little change since then because the trance state, the ecstasy, what the shaman was master of, basically it's not the goal, it's the mean. And what is the goal of the shamanic activity? So one of my masters, Mihai Hopal, if you know his name, he's very good in uh, North European and Asian shamanism, so the LAP and the Siberian shamanism. So he said, in agreement with other anthropologists, that shaman is that kind of healer who is contacting with spirits. So contacting spirits, that's the common denominator of shamanism. Then how comes? What are those spirits? What is intriguing if you study, you know, what shamans do? And, for example, what is their role within the tribe? Michael Winkelmann called them psycho-integrators. Shamans, they basically, they are healers, but not only the sickness of a person. They're usually the healers of everything. In a shamanic uh, culture, uh, healing is not only biological, it's bio, psycho, social, spiritual. So if there is, and of course it depends from tribe to tribe, but if we go back enough in time, we can see that in the past, shamanic uh, healing ceremonies, they were community ceremonies not the western type. The western type treatment is dyadic. You know, doctor, patient, therapist, client. No. The shamanic uh, treatment is community. It happens in the community. And let's say when they treat the gallbladder problem or the stomach problem of one tribe members, they do not only treat the stomach, the somatic problem of that person, they treat their mental problems, their social relationships with others, and at the same time, other participants of this healing ceremony, they also get some treatment for their social and psychological problems. And the spiritual part comes in because at the same time, while they are doing this kind of healing, they are resetting their connection with their deities. You know, that's why biopsychosocial spiritual, at the same token. So that can explain why a huge uh, medicine man watching his American surgeon, who was a brilliant you know, surgeon, was watching him and said, it's amazing what my pale face co uh, colleague can do, but all patients, all people, they will be more after all treatment they will come out of our treatment richer than they went in. You see the difference? Western treatment fix you, fixes you. Okay, sometimes we need it and we're marvelous. But somehow the shamanic healing is not about only fixing, getting back to the premorbid level, you know, what you had before the illness, using it for growth, personal growth. And... Uh, I don't want to go more into the details of shamanic medicine, but I would like to share with you what I grasped as uh, very important. First of all, you should know, of course, you know, I don't want to hurt your intelligence, that shamanic cultures, they are pre-civilizatory cultures. Basically the only culture before agriculture. So they are older than 10,000 years old, pro pro possibly 40,000 years old at least. What do you think? Why is important? Pre-civilizatory. 
What is civilization about? <sighs> of course, it's a huge topic, and those from, you know, here from liberal art, philosophy, social sciences can give a, can write a PhD dissertation about this. But I would like to emphasize two important points, which is important for shamanic healing and for your ayahuasca experience. Civilization is about control and comfort. Think about it. The two basics. This is what you don't go for in a shamanic ceremony. Forget control. Don't be a control freaky monkey, you know. We can discuss uh, what kind of problem you can have. And definitely it's not about comfort. So you have to let it go. You know, when I hear, you know, Westerners, yeah, please, the music is too loud. <laughs> you know, again, the comfort and control part. Uh, or <laughs> so, and interestingly, this control and comfort, especially control issue, you can even find it a little bit in the Eastern mystical tradition. Because Eastern mystical tradition is already civilizatory, not pre-civilizatory. Only the shamanic tradition is pre-civilizatory. So when I hear my friends who are very much interested in the mystical beyond, and they say that <sighs> psychedelic shamanic uh, uh, drugs. No, 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 no. Because meditation, you get as far as you can handle. Control. <laughs> uh, if you read Terence McKenna, what he said, any time a guy went into his chamber with five gram of mushroom in hand, his knees was wobbling. And he went into the meditation chamber. Without mushroom, without mushroom, you know no wobbling of knees. So basically, here you can grab that the shamanic uh, technology somewhat more consequent, you know? Consequent, uh, I mean that uh, they try to leave no room for control. And as far as comfort, anyone who read the book of Michael Horner, The Way of the Shaman, which describes, I think, the first uh, ayahuasca, uh, ayahuasca experience a Westerner had, he was tortured for days before he had his ayahuasca with the Shuars, I think he had that. So, anytime in Brazil someone comes from Europe or from North America, from the US, and they are in jet lag and they ask us, whether in this condition are we supposed to take our ayahuasca or not? Again, you feel the comfort. You know, I, I am in discomfort after this long trip, so I suppose I, I just go, I just remembered Michael Horner. He was not in jet lag, you know, guys. <laughs> he, he, he was happy to be alive and to breathe, you know, because he was chased down in the jungle. So basically the answer is yes, yes. You know, <laughs> the more stress you have, if you really want to, is the, on the shamanic way and not on the yuppie urban way, you know, then forget about your comfort, you know, whether you know, after jet lag, no, no. Oh, and my uh, back hurts. <laughs> so, yeah, so the shaman. But you should know it's not about abandoning control. Sometimes you hear some gurus, teachers, oh, you should abandon control. No. The way I watch, you know, the shamanic healers, those guys were pretty much in control, you know. They really knew what's going on in that uh, mystical field, what was happening during the ceremony, so what kind of spirit was coming in or not. They were in control, but no ego inflation. Ego inflation, the big ego, you know, what you have to curb. So it is not your ego what you have to abandon, absolutely. And... Uh, and what, what about this ego? What else? Um, may I have a glass of water just? Please, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it's not absolutely releasing control, it's rather delegating control. 
So I think, I thank you, in these shamanic ceremonies, you know, if you go to the mystical beyond, you have to delegate the control to your protectors. And here comes another important issue. You heard me discussing the setting, the ritual, and here comes the set, the mindset. And another reason why Westerners, they are not there yet and they still have problems with uh, hallucinogens and psychedelics, because we don't have a common cosmology. Uh, Louis told us, don't even think what we are doing with ayahuasca, it's shamanic. The reason that it is not because we don't share the same cosmology. You have to have the same mythology. And one important part of this mythology that these people, they believe in their power animals, in their protectors and so on. So when they go into their experience, they give their trust and guidance to their power animals, protectors and so on. So sometimes when I hear about you know, Western use of psychedelics, I miss very much asking for protection. You know? It's interesting. Have you ever heard about Ozora festival? In Hungary, you, every year there used to be a psychedelic festival. I've never seen Hungarians there, only Estonians. Were you there? <laughs> oh, um, uh, others from Europe, you know, for somehow the entrance fee was too steep, so Hungarians basically there are not too ma many there. Sometimes I give presentations there, and uh, I discussed that point, you know, that how important is faith. I will show you what, uh, what are the rules of engagement in the mystical beyond and then emphasize the importance of faith. And one uh, Dutch guy said, uh, what can I do? I have no faith. I am a non-believer. Like, if you don't believe in Ayahuasca, don't even try it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yes, I, I told you, so the faith, uh, we will discuss the role of faith. So the trust and the protection is important because that gives you some uh, calmness, so probably your anxiety will be less if you really believe that there is some protection for you, so we'll, you will not get that crazy you know, ego dissolution and depersonalization type of bad trips. And the other importance, intention. So basically the way I saw Ayahuasca ceremonials with Louis Luna, it was about intention. You have to verbalize it. What do you expect? Because it is an important guidance during the experience. Do you know what? Why it's important that you verbalize clearly your intent? Because if you have this, what we call gringo effect, gringos, we are all gringos here. I see no others, maybe. So the typical gringo effect, you know, we are control freaky, uh, guys who love comfort and control and usually we get if you don't learn you know how to release it we get the, those bad trips and I think I'm getting crazy I'm falling apart you know oh my god you know everything is falling down and crumbles falling apart some people try to use uh, mantras ohms the best way just think why I am here what was my intention and do you know that helps you to be pulled together. First of all, until someone in you asking, oh my God, what's happening? Oh my God, I am going crazy. That means someone is at home. Don't worry. If that guy is not at home, we call that anesthesia. You know, you have it on the operating table. <laughs> until someone is asking, oh my God, I will remain this way forever, then someone is at home. <laughs> no problem, no problem. So basically just think about it. Basically, what the heck I wanted, why I am here? Ah, okay. <laughs> so that's, the, I think, the best way against this dreadful ego dissolution. That's why intention is important. And I told you, protection. 
So I emphasize these two. And then the end, the day I saw it, the sharing. Then the group comes together and they verbalize, share what they had during the ceremony. But you know, it is not mandatory. So you don't have to share everything, you know. So if I ask or told you that you are the avatar, you know, and you will save the world, you don't have to share it, you can keep it for yourself, because probably it's bullshit, you are better off, you know. We will discuss the ego trips. Perhaps you can discuss it already, but so watch, be careful with those big ego trips, you know. The green angel came, kissed my forehead, I got downloaded all the information of the universe. It was great. Okay, share with, share some with me. Oh, I forget. <laughs> you see, there is not too much learning in it, but maybe later. So, going back, that puzzled me, you know, how come that the shaman brings order into the community? Just little system theory, you know? There is a system, the tribe, which is a little bit in chaos, disarray, uh, the equilibrium, you know, has changed. To fix it, you need information, but not from inside, it must come from outside. Very simple, you know? For hundred and hundred years, you cannot fix a system only from inside. You need outside information. So, that was my leading cause. During the shamanic journey, the shaman gets some information. But where does it come from? And basically, at, I arrived at this duality of knowledge. In advance, I have to tell you, I suppose that I discovered something important, but basically I discovered the lukewarm water, you know, big discovery, because a Kabbalist rabbi, a Sufi <laughs> monk told me, we know this. Every mystical teaching knows that human knowledge, you know, has two foundations, but they quickly added, eventually these two is one. Basically, I never got to that point to make it one, basically I am still at this separation. So that is the, what the, I call percept or cognitive knowledge, and this is what in the West we consider knowledge. The other, we don't know too much. Intuition, Western scholars, they suppose that some sort of parallel processing, you know, of sensory information. So you have an intuition about a person because you are watching the face, the mimics, the posture, da 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 da. This is what most scholars uh, consider intuition. No, intuition is here, something much closer to the Jungian intuition, so the intuitive knowledge what Jung used. Basically you, you get something from the outside and to put it briefly, the point is that the environment can make a representation inside you by two ways. One way is the very typical what we know through the sensory organs into your brain. So basically through our senses we get a representation of the environment inside us. This kind of representation is based on energy exchange. You know, photons are hitting your retina, you know, some uh, vibration of the air hits your, you know, inner ear membrane, energy exchange, and essentially this is what physicists call local effects. But it seems that there is another way, the environment, and that's the fun, the whole universe, can make a representation inside you using non-local connections, non-local correlations. If you don't know this, go check it out, <laughs> because it's very important at the 21st century to know what is non-locality, because this really steers up whole physics, and possibly it can steer up the whole psi research. Dean Radin, if you know Dean Radin, the big psy, psy researcher, in so parapsychology researcher, so he agrees absolutely. He had a similar idea in entanglement. And he tried to explain telepathy, psychokinesis using non-locality. So this kind of... So that's my point. There is a way the, the environment can make a representation inside you. Interestingly, it is not in your brain. It is in your whole body. 
and this is where the shaman is having his journey so this I have this model sensory information to your brain non-local correlations into your body your full body and basically the shaman is doing his trip here inside his body the focus of his attention is not on his sensory perceptions but his focus on his attention is in this hologram what non-local correlation makes inside you so basically the shamanic journey is not your my speculation your consciousness is not leaving your body you know two words can leave each other but consciousness well, for me so basically the focus of your attention is scanning this internal representation what the outside world can make inside you using the non-local correlations connections and by the way out of body experiences you heard about this OBE I suppose yeah you heard that some people they can get a verifiable information during out of body experience so they can see a tennis shoe on the roof you know so uh, I try to explain it this way the funny part of this that using this model that time I did not realize just later that basically I'm saying the same like Aboriginal native people held or hold basically they are discussing about free souls uh, you know the shamanic world you has three levels three words upper middle uh, upper middle lower and this number three comes back again in the shamanic view we have three soul parts mental soul body soul and the free soul eternal soul and the mental soul of course they use different language you know, for that the mental soul corresponds to our ego what they consider body soul it corresponds to uh, that kind of physiological mechanism system what we have in our body and the most tricky for us Westerners you know this eternal the free soul the immortal soul what Emerson called over soul <coughs> basically on my point this is an outprint outside of your body uh, an imprint sorry an imprint outside of your body because anything happening within you that makes an imprint outside of you because life is about energy exchange so if there is exchange of energy there is mass exchange Einstein you know special relativity if there is mass change Einstein general relativity the space-time fabric changes so basically what's happening inside you makes a little uh, imprint outside of you so what you are it's not only biological yes you have something non-biological out there you may say oh that's so tiny but anyone knows quantum physics tiny can have very really significant impact so basically I realized that what I depicted here basically corresponds well the mental soul the body soul and the immortal soul and what do they say many tribes they say that your visions you get it from your body soul so this is what the Shuars the headhunters say this is what the Huna Polynesian mystics say the way the shaman gets his vision or her vision it is coming from your body the body soul gives the vision and basically this is what I am stated for you you know the shamanic journey is happening inside his or her body and uh, the other important notion what they say that the body soul is the interface between the mental soul and the immortal soul if you go to Scribd, you can find my papers about the free souls and what kind of interesting interactions this uh, native tribal wisdom describes between the soul parts I call you heard about psychodynamic psychotherapy I call this 
soul dynamic psychotherapy. Because the psychodynamic psychotherapy discusses the dynamics between the superego, ego, and deed, you know. The soul dynamic psychotherapy is based on the interaction between your mental soul, body soul, and others. This is uh, a depiction of two cultures, one of what I started this presentation with, you know, the South American, and this is the Egyptian. And basically what you see here, that each of them uh, holds something in his hand, what probably very important for his culture. Egyptian civilization was a literate civilization, you know, hieroglyphs. You should know Tivanaku, most of the uh, very ancient South American civilizations, they were illiterate. Basic, and they were able to build cities, amazing pyramids, you know, the pyramids in Peru, uh, Caral, for example, as old like Giza, and there are still 120 buried in the sand of the desert in Peru. Who knows, maybe there is an older one. So very interesting. Just watch archaeology, interesting findings. So it may turn out that the new world is the old world, you know, other way around. So they were able to build civilization by what? Possibly by this. This is a snuffing tray, a snuff tray. Basically, they used it for mind-altering techniques. It was Yopo, what they used 2000 BC, in, even in Peru. So, my point is here that uh, the way they built their civilization was possibly using this other way, the other foundation of knowledge, the intuitive one. You remember? So, basically, what I am saying that <coughs> South American civilization was good at this one. By the way, discussing Egyptians, I think they were good at both. They were good at both. And it's funny that Western Egyptolo Egyptologists, they take very seriously what Egyptians did on the material world, you know, the architectures, the art, metallurgy. But Egyptians said that's nothing the most important, the spiritual teachings, you know, what we have. No, we don't take this seriously. Of course you do, but uh, I have never seen a PhD, you know, taking seriously what uh, Egyptians hold about spirit, for example, about the souls, you know. They had about eight or nine. In, in that article I told you about the free souls, I try to point out how these eight, nine Egyptian souls, they possibly came from this original free. Because the point is that, that the big difference, why the soul concept was derailed in Europe, in European tradition, the main reason that this shamanic view was based on experience. Shamans, they did not speculate about the free souls. They experienced it. You see the direct intuitive way. The free soul concept entered European thinking by Pythagoras. You know, after Pythagoras, Platon, Aristoteles, then Galen, Paracelsus. Guys, they speculated about it. And they totally, sorry, messed it up. Totally messed it up speculation. Galenus, he totally forgot about, you know, this mental body and eternal soul. Aristoteles, Plato somehow gave some credit to the eternal immortal soul. Aristoteles not at all. And Galen, he put it in the liver, in the heart, you know, so totally derailed the concept. So no wonder that uh, the soul concept is out in Western thinking. I, I'm trying to bring it back. For example, two weeks ago I gave a presentation to my colleagues about embodiment. Anyone familiar with it? It's a new buzzword in anthropology and in humanities. And basically I try to point out that embodiment basically rediscovers the soul, or the body soul, what uh, native people call body soul. So here is the point. This guy is holding his instrument of civilization and he is holding his. So, uh, do you know why I 
put it the, here, if you understand my concept that there are two foundations of knowledge, then we agree animals they can access these two foundations. But artificial intelligence, they only focus on the perceptual cognitive. Have you heard about an AI guy who tried to build a telepathic machine? Guys, I heard that Turing, you know his rules, Turing put it down as a test. You know the Turing test for a computer? He said the real computer, you know, must be telepathic. <laughs> he, he knew about it, but of course we don't like to speak about it, it's so crazy. But Turing was an extremely talented guy. So when I hear Nobel laureates, big scientists, they say, ah, it's possible in the future they can download your consciousness from your neurons into a chip. Do you know what is my answer? Yours, not mine. Mine you, you cannot download. Basically, because we humans, we are not only one network, at least three, so p perhaps more. But definitely, I think you agree with me, no, it's pretty narrow, supposing that you are nothing else, just a bunch of neurons. This is what Francis Crick, you know, the discoverer with Watson of the DNA. Uh, Crick said, you are nothing else, just a bunch of neurons. Again, my answer, you, not me. So I am more. So, so there is more network. So unless they try to use other networks, they will not get a real conscious machine. But here comes the other way around. Can you imagine a being which only has direct intuitive knowledge, but not the perceptual cognitive? Plants. Possibly, they, this is what I suppose, they can have this second foundation of knowledge, but do you know what? They cannot tell you. They cannot tell you because they don't have this perceptual cognitive way of processing. But they can tell to the Oyoskero shaman what Jeremy Narby said, Louis Luna said, if a new illness hits the tribe and the Oyoskero shaman, the curandero, want to find a new plant to treat it, they don't do trial and error hundred times until they find it. No. Uh, he thinks about a plant, he put the leaves of that plant into the ayahuasca, drinks the ayahuasca. In the trance of ayahuasca, the spirit of that plant appears and communicates to him. For example, you are wrong, it's not me, I cannot have this illness, but do you know what? I can tell you what plant can do that. So basically, just one trial. <laughs> so, so this suggests, you know, that some sort of other way of knowledge exchange is happening here and if you know Terence McKenna he spoke about mushroom consciousness so possibly that in this altered state of consciousness when we are more rely on this intuitive knowledge not on the senses then we can connect to the plant consciousness and the plant knowledge I, I'm sure many for you it sounds absolutely crazy but Please, understand one thing. I told you, I suppose they had a culture built on this non-local intuitive knowledge. And horrible addicto, they even use mind-altering techniques. Just imagine, if you put a, a hunter-gatherer Indian into a high school algebra class, that guy would bring out nothing. But do you know, it works the other way around. If we Westerner, we enter this realm, most of us will pull out nothing. Because at the same way, you know, algebra needs years of years of learning. Guys, entering this realm, it also needs learning. So that's one reason why many of us still skeptical understanding, you know, how this can work, but Christian Rech, if you know him, he's an interesting guy. First of all, he said, I'm not Christian. His name is Christian, but he's that no, he said in North Germany there are still pagans there, you know, who are not Christian. <laughs> so he's following the paganic tradition. He, he went to the Lacandon 
Maya Lakandon tribe in the 70s, I think. And he later learned his only way he survived because he had long hair. So that was the sign that he is not Christian. The Mayas, the Lakandons, they were not baptized, so they hated Christian Indians. Those were, you know, shortcut. The long hair that was the sign. So, so Christian Wretch he said that uh, basically with Western mentality we have big difficulty understanding pre-Columbian civilizations. So you see, I'm trying to crack this walnut, this knot, by supposing that the second uh, foundation of knowledge what they cultivated. So here the point is that you have to learn this. You have to learn this. A shaman goes through years of years training. Oh, by the way, do you know that I... Uh, do you know that usually it's pretty general that shamans, they don't have mentors. It is not another shaman. You, you, there is always exemptions, I know. But many times, especially the big shamans, they are not the apprentices of another shaman. The spirits teach them. It's pretty universal, you know. The big healers, shamanic healers, they are not apprentices. They are apprentices of the spirits, but not of another guy. So again, you see that there is a learning process which is totally out of our realm. So they go through a knowledge accumulation process, but that process, you know, it's not the typical what I call here the perceptual cognitive. So you can understand if the plants have this uh, other way of knowledge, and it can be huge. Oh, sorry, I forgot. Mushi, mushi, bocsánat, előadás. Puzi, 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 szia. Okay, my wife. So, uh, just, okay. So, uh, uh, where was I? <laughs> so intuitive knowledge, whatever. So, yeah. Oh, and just imagine, according to my model, you know, or puny brain, which uh, pretty impressive, but comparing to what, you know? By the way, do you know that our brain is smaller than fifteen thousand years ago? I have to share this. This bad news, guys. Uh, <laughs> Cro-Magnon Cro had almost 250 cube centimeter larger brain. Guys, you can, you, you know, uh, yeah, motor bicycle can use this kind of volume, you know. So, uh, 250 cube centimeter. So we have lost this. This came out two or three years ago. And do you know, it's funny. Do you know what was the first reaction of scholars, academics? And that's... 200, it doesn't matter, you know, basically, no, that's insignificant. For the last two million years, anthropological books, they make book hoopla about, you know, every cup, cup centimeter increase, and suddenly it doesn't matter. You know, they say, oh, size doesn't matter. <laughs> Are they discussing penises? Penises? But even penises' size really matters. So, <laughs> and my main problem was, do you know who is saying this? that this 250 capsimeter doesn't matter. A shrinking brain is saying this about itself. <laughs> ah, that's, uh, you know, uh, this is anyone familiar with domestication, anthropology, basically domesticated animals go through the same, so we also domesticated ourselves, so, so yeah. And uh, some people said, oh, possibly our brain is more eff efficient. One year ago in genetics it came out that every 2,000 years we humans we are losing two intelligence genes and two emotional stability genes. So the question is not that we are getting smarter. So stop doing this. F figure it out something, you know, how to stop this process. Because as you see there is a big denial. So many scholars, they don't want to face it. So, so the point that I started with size, so imagine if you have a network which is much bigger than the human brain, like a mushroom, do you know 
How large is the largest mushroom on Earth? Three cubic kilometer. The mycelia is underground. You know, it's enormous network. The mushroom, you know, is just a sexual organ which comes out. So the so let's suppose that enormous mycelia network can do this kind of direct intuitive processing. What kind of knowledge can be there? Okay, I know, I'm speculating, but that's why we are here. <laughs> okay. And Terence McKenna, yeah, he will, I'm following his lead here. So, by the way, it's not only the mushroom. There is a huge sea.